Now I'm going to talk about why you might want to have a conscious business and what is a conscious business. But mostly I'm going to talk about how to create a conscious business because the how will tell you about the why. Two reasons, and I'll put them on the board because we're running out of time. And this came out of a Harvard Business Review article in 2013 when they said, and they, they studied 18 conscious companies against about the same number of traditional companies and they found out that co companies that practice conscious business perform 10 times better. It's not 10% better or 100% better, it's 1,000% better. So there's a huge difference and I think that's the first thing it, and it's my, in my experience there is a big difference between having a conscious business and one that's not. The second thing that they came up with is that well-run value-centered businesses can contribute to humankind in more tangible ways than any other organisation in society. So they're important. So they're amazing and they're important. So it's well worth doing it. Now, of course, because we spend a lot of time at work and we get our meaning from work and we socialise at work and we get our security from work, then obviously it's important. That does affect huge part of our lives. So they should be really good, not really bad. Okay, so that's the why. What is a conscious business? Or firstly, what is consciousness? Because that's what we're talking about. And I'm just going to give you three words to keep it easy for us, because you could actually spend forever on this subject. <laughs> I did a bit of research and I never came back. <laughs> Um, awareness. So, awareness, so consciousness, as far as we're concerned, is awareness, self awareness, and mindfulness. And they're all slightly different. Because you can be aware of something, aware of the traffic, whatever. And you can be self aware, but that's harder, of course. And mindful is a little bit different because it's like being aware, but you're being careful. Like if you're in a yoga class and you want to leave or enter a room and there's a lot of mats down, you're aware of the mats but you may actually walk across them. Whereas if you're mindful, you know that you shouldn't walk on the yoga mats and you'll be careful. So it's a slightly different um, way of looking at it. So that is consciousness, so that's what we're going to take through this next um, session. And then what we have to look at now is what is a conscious business? Well, a traditional business wants to maximise the value of the shareholders or the shares. That's their only focus. But a um, conscious business wants to is mindful of the total well-being of the owners or shareholders, of the suppliers, of the customers, of the staff, of the community, and the planet. So the difference is. A narrow focus on the needs of the shareholders versus a total view on everybody who's involved, all the stakeholders. I'll read you a little thing about that. This, these two things came out of that Harvard Business Review, and here's another paragraph that I took out of it. It says here, Conscious companies treat their, share, their stakeholders better. As a consequence, their suppliers are happy to do business with them. Employees are more engaged, productive and likely to stay. These companies are more welcome in their communities and their customers are more satisfied and loyal. The most conscious companies give more and they get more in return. The inescapable conclusion, it pays to care widely and deeply. So that came out of that Harvard Business Review article. But I might just read you another little paragraph here. This is another, there's a few books on conscious business. This is one of them. And it's called, and it's called Conscious Business, How to Build Value Through Values. But, in it, but what we're going to do today is not in this book. Let's have a look so you get something different. I'm going to read you a paragraph from a section called An Invitation to Conscious Business. You know that there's more to work than making money. 
you know that it is possible to experience great joy as you engage in meaningful work, of which you are proud, soulful work that confronts you with challenges and develops your skills, work that is in line with your mission in life. This is work you enjoy doing for its own sake, work that provides you with a significant material and spiritual rewards. So that's the kind of work that we're trying to, <coughs> to achieve. I won't put fill in the rest of these yet. The first example we're going to look at is the, the soccer league that, that my company, Computerland, was part of in about 1999. So we entered this team, or my receptionist did actually, entered the team in, in the Saxton Road Soccer League. There's a summer league. Spell. This, this first part here, I'm going to call the vision. And there's three things that you have to have or, or, or look at to make a conscious business. Keep in mind, I'm going to use the soccer league as an example because it's a, it's a concrete example. It's not intangible. The first one is, is a, a goal. Is an ideal for your higher self. So that's the first thing you have to have. We won't be too applicable to cycle, but don't worry, because we'll see it when we look at the next example. The second thing is you have to decide what business you are really in. And the third thing is sea changes. What's changing in the market around you? What's changing in society around you? So you have to be aware of those sea changes. Okay, I'm going to tell you about this this game of soccer then. Here. Yeah. So it went like this. We lost the first game, one twenty-five, nor twenty-six and then nor 25, like that. Um, so if we, then I decided we need to apply a bit of conscious business to what we were doing. So um, we were sort of over 40, so we weren't fit or anything like that. A normal or a traditional manager would say, look, you've got to get fitter, you're going to have to come do more training, we have to get younger people in, things like that. Well, I had a look at this and I decided, I was just going past the receptionist one day and she, the morning of the next game, she said, we'll probably get thrashed. And I said, no, this is what we're going to do. I said, what we're going to do is we'll keep one, the goalie and two people back here, and we'll put three people up here, and we'll just kick the ball down like that. Now, because I haven't, you wonder why you could do that, but there are some sea changes that you don't know about, because we're just thinking soccer here. But in fact, um, one of the changes are at six people, it's in half a field, and there's no offside. So suddenly there are sea changes that are going on that we don't, we want often that we're still playing soccer. So we could do that because my people could stand out there, normally they would be offside. As long as they don't go in this semicircle here, they're fine. So I trained them to do that, it took about a minute. So we won this next game 6-1, just by making that structural change. And the next game it was 6-0, 6-0, 6-0, all like that, right through to the end of the thing when we lost the last game to the top team in North 1 and finished second in the league. <laughs> we had our staff meeting on the morning, always the morning after the game of soccer. And from then on, every time they came in and, and they said, what do you have done during the week? They talked about their big victory the night before. And so you could see that, just that change from there to there, where we went from feather duster to rooster, effectively, was affecting their whole life. And the thing is, they thought they were all doing it. All the players thought they were doing it. They didn't, didn't realise it was a structure so much. They thought they were suddenly playing good, which is really quite interesting. And later on, a few months later, or maybe a year after that, I was up in Auckland, 
and I, I was talking, giving another talk to a group, and I told them about this because it was fresh in my mind. And they, and the question that came up was, because I says, this is the structure section here. I said you need to have your structure right, and this is a good example because you can see the change in the structure. And one of the people there says, "How do you find? How do you define structure?" And I said, "It's just one of those, just like this, changing that was a sort of a ka-ching moment." I said, "Oh, it's what kind of relationships? Stru structure is equal to what kind?" of relationships do we want? What kind of relationships do we want? Question mark. So suddenly we're moving it from a practical, physical example to an intangible one. And this became a, a key question in conscious business. What kind of relationship are we having? And I've told them about this and they all say the same thing and do you know what that might be? But when I told people about this they said to me it wouldn't work for us. That was the only response I ever got. It wouldn't work for us. Just quite interesting. The other interesting thing about this thing is that three quarters of the way through the game we were um, we were ahead by 1-0. And by the end of the game, the last quarter, there was nobody, the opposition left the field. So that, that created the structure, or kind of structure, for how to create a conscious business. And we haven't looked at these two yet, and we're not sure about this yet. So there's the first embryo of the structure. Prior to coming, prior to being in the Pewland, uh, I, I was a tutor here at Polytech for 12 years. And we had a bit of management training about a year before I decided to go and work for Pewland and buy the franchise. And, and the, the management guy who came down, he was a really interesting guy, and he said to me, he said, the company he worked for, and I think it was Mobile Oil, their main thing was the truth will set you free. And that really resonated with me. So when I actually went into business and, and started, and I had I didn't know anything. I'd been in the polytech all my life. It was completely at sea. It was a big thing. But I picked up on that mantra, the truth will set you free. And the whole company was based around that. So in terms of our vision, it became the truth will set you free. Just by de facto, just from being here, what he said and the fact that it resonated with me. Now that's not the complete saying, you know what the rest of it is? You shall know the truth. Sorry? You shall know the truth and that is risen. Yes, that's the that's I'll ask that question in a minute. <laughs> 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 the interim question was <laughs> You shall know the truth, but first it will cause pain. <laughs> But the thing is, if you want to have a conscious business, just put that into your vision statement or something, and you'll have one 80%. You'll have an 80% conscious business straight away, just doing that. Because that's how we changed everything. Because every time there's a problem, oh well, we've got to fess up, haven't we? Or just, you know, and it created an amazing relationship. Because remember, we needed to find what kind of relationships, and we wanted one that was based on truth and openness and honesty and caring. And we got it just with that one mantra in 1988. And um, because people became to rely on their computers much more because they were networked and we had no mail and all that sort of stuff. So that was a big sea change that was going on at that time. Because of that, I decided that the business we were really in was a peace of mind business. So we're getting a huge change here. And how, how we're working to change that. A normal high tech company will we, we sell everything they can get, you know. The salesmen are out there, they get extra margin if they sell that brand this week and they sell this and that. 
So we didn't went into that. So that, that was our sort of vision, those three things. As a result of that, um, so we reduced our stock. We had about 30,000 stock items we could sell from 30,000 to about 30. And that completely simplified the whole business. Because with the salespeople out there, they're always quoting an AST or an Epson or a Toshiba or whatever. So straight away, and only, because we only had two brands, and that was a Compaq and HP, which now, of course, become one company. Then, of course, we only sold Compaq computers and HP printers. And then secondly, we only sold products, these 30, <laughs> with a three-year warranty. We gave everyone cost plus pricing, because that was an open, because of this mantra here, we want to be open and transparent with our customers. So we said, we'll just add a certain margin on and you're about to see what the cost is. And you know that you're getting the best price every time. You don't have to shop around. So we did that and then we we eliminated sales force. We got rid of the sales people <laughs> who basically wrecked the, would have wrecked the company for their own self-interest if you let them go. <laughs> so we got rid of them because we didn't need any, and I'll explain why in a minute. We eliminated um, no technical training. We got rid of, there's a big thing in those things, we had about 20 engineers, and we always had to send them off for training, it was really expensive, of, of fixing things up, not the software side, but for fixing up hardware that broke down. So we managed to get rid of that, and I'll explain how in a minute. But we, with this service contract, and the reason why people bought it because it was such an incredible deal. Now, we're back into ka-ching moments here because Kudan was an American company and, and the service contract they showed us was full of legal stuff about how they'll sue you and all that sort of stuff. And um, so it wasn't very good, but I was explaining like I am now on the board what the service contract included. And I realised there was only four things in it. Because it was a huge smorgasbord before that, nobody understood it. And they were one meetings. So I put a section of the meetings. I charged about 2,000 a year to have meetings. People, they, that was a bit of. You need to have an objection, don't you? <laughs> they said, oh, why should we pay for meetings? I said, we're going to come and talk about your company, about your future. This is so important to you. Planning is the most important thing that you can do. You should do this, it's so important. And we made it important and they paid for it. And that was a really big thing. And then secondly, we offered them relief equipment. And this is, in those days, there was a thing in the back room called the relief printer. It was an old god of a thing. And nobody wanted it. But see, because we had three year warranties, if anything broke down, we we could um, we kept it in stock and we could just go and replace it easily. So, but these people paid for the say ten grand a year to have instant relief equipment. My relief equipment was brand new. We never gave anybody. If it was under warranty, they got a new one. If it was out of warranty, we'd sell them a new one. <laughs> but they they were guaranteed that relief equipment for two weeks. Now, so a lot of really flash gear went out, brand new, and none of it ever came back. Not once. I mean, 12 years, those, they wanted to buy it. So that, and that, that's why we didn't have to have technical training, because we never had to fix anything. <laughs> so this is all ducks in a row stuff. And then the other thing was, um, just as an aside, because we were just selling Compaq and HP, I went and we needed to stock this kind of relief equipment. I went back to them and, and negotiated a 5% price reduction 
on all their gear, which is all we sell. And most computer companies only make about 5%, so that immediately doubled our bottom line, just that one thing. And we got that agreement with um, Compaq in, in Auckland, and uh, all the other computer labs tried to get on it, but they wouldn't give it to them. I said, no, just, just Nelson. <laughs> so we are becoming a highly profitable company with no stress, and with all, no sales staff, and everything locked in, just by applying this kind of thinking to your company. The third good thing we had was risks. See, the thing about being in business, you've got to decide what the risk is and who's owning it. And it was a bit of a grey area, so you can either say to the customer, well, look, you take the risk, or should I take the risk, in which case I'm going to charge you for it. And so there were a lot of risks like viruses and backups, and there was about seven uh, risks. And I always said to them, well, do you want, should I take the risk or do you want the risk <laughs> of all these things that might happen? And they said, well, you have it. Okay, so there's another five grand or whatever it was a year for that. And then the next thing was the labour. Now, that should be a sector of 83,000. Say that's going to come to 100,000. See, these are quite small compared to the labour component. But... I never, I never signed any up, buddy, up for the labour at all because I said, look, this is just a hard figure. Why well, say we just don't have that? We'll just, we'll do it on time materials. And so they only had to sign up for 17 grand or something like that a year. It was nothing. But that means they were forced to just buy our platform, a standard platform, to get the, the buying, to get the really good support with all that relief here. It was a complete no-brainer. If we if we charged for the labour, we probably would have lost money because it's so hard to guess how much you're going to. That's enough for that. And then we come to the third area. This remember, this is structure. See, nobody nobody has ever known that, ever how that worked, how computer learning worked, and why it was so successful. Um, I was probably the only one who really knew the big picture. I thought I told everyone, but it wasn't. Now the next bit here is, what's, a, what's another name for this? What kind of relationship do we want? What's another name for that? This is our culture, isn't it? Our structure is our culture. What you don't do is more important than what you do. This is a really, really important concept here, because this is what creates the culture. Oh, we don't sell shitty gear. Like, the sales guys used to come around because we were a big company. We sold over half a million dollars worth of hardware a month with no sales force. Just came in every month. Um, I'm not sure why I sold that company. I was thinking I must have been crazy. So you say, oh, we don't sell products without a three-year three warranty. So straight away that limited what was going on. Or we don't lie to our customers. Or, you know, whatever, and you found out what you don't do, and therefore the culture was formed from that, and you had to contain it. And this people knew what we didn't do, they really did. Because, oh, we're not going to say that, that's not true. And we had amazing relationships with all our customers. Thank you, Any questions? And every business I can work with, we can do that for them. If they want to, if they're willing. Oh, the other thing is, when it, I go to computer land conferences over the years, and we were always one of the top performing branches. We had like 33 staff in Nelson. Well, computer land Christchurch only had 33 staff. Um, I told them about this, and do you know what they said? Sorry? It wouldn't work for us. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? The same thing. Everyone. Every, not just one, everyone. It wouldn't work for us. Oh yeah, here's some... Um, <laughs> here's hyper-consciousness here. We've got consciousness here. And we've got the mind here. So if we go like that, yeah, this is the left brain, and that's the right brain. 
So this somebody is a human in this field of hyperconscious, conscious and the mind. Like that. Does that seem a reasonable diagram? Um, <coughs> there was a um, TED talk called Stroke of Insight. Did anybody see that? Oh, yeah. It's about a lady who had a stroke oh, on her left brain. Yeah. And as soon as it happened, she lost her vision, just everything really pixelated. She tried to ring for help, she couldn't. She couldn't dial the number, she remembered the number, but she couldn't dial it. And she got an end by holding a finger on one number and pushing that, and she knew that was the last number or something. So when the, when the left brain goes, my question is when I saw that was, what the hell does the right brain do? You know, you think you've lost, lost half your brain, does the other half's going to at least get you, know, get you down to the hospital or something. But a complete, she couldn't do anything. So, and this, I'm not an expert in this area. Okay. So I thought, well, probably the right brain is, is the one that connects to the conscious brain, the conscious world, most likely. It's a, much, it's, it's a much bigger brain. Don't forget, the left brain is like talking to a lawyer because it's always trying to protect you. You know, you go to a lawyer and they say, no, it won't work, don't do it. You know? <laughs> I know three people have tried that and they fail and they're always giving you the negative. This is the, the brain that was, is much more security uh, conscious for us. It's like the ego, I guess. Because we're not getting time. So this side we've got money. This is the left brain, it's money. This one is about time. I'll put that in because that's really important. Cool. The right brain is about time. Money. It's linear versus holistic. It's analytical versus creative or imaginative. It's logical versus intuition. It's space time versus quantum time. It's a computer versus daydreams. It's black and white versus color. It's stress versus fun and laughter. I didn't say that, but running computer land was the most stress-free environment you could have ever gone. Everyone loved it. Customers loved it. People used to say, what do I do? They didn't know what I did, because I didn't have anything to do. <laughs> I just had a good time. I still can't believe I saw it. Um, and it's male, feminine. So there's quite a contrast here. And this is, this is definitely the doing. This is what happens when you say, just do it. It's not rocket science. You immediately disengage from your creative side. So how are you going to get all these ka moments if you are also busy? Are you busy? It's the common thing. What the hell? Yeah. <laughs> Why would that come? Where did that come from? So this is a busy world. This is busyness, you know. They're too busy. They're too busy and their brain is too fried up to be able to think creatively. If we took this thing here again, this is, I'll finish on this note. So this, is, this is the controlling brain, the money brain, the logical brain. What would you call that line there? I'm putting through there. Habit. Sorry? Habit. Ah, uh, no. Woman should get this, but. <laughs> this is called the glass ceiling. It's not designed to keep women out, it's designed to keep people who think like women out. People who are creative, who have fun, laughter, won't compromise their values. You know, and, and not stuck into this busy world that we're stuck in. And that's the trick, you've got to know how to get into this world so you can do that creative thinking. Oh, cool. There you are, some local Thanks. beers from Stoke Brewery. Okay. Thank right. you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs>